you all for joining us for the high level event environment and trade for a sustainable and inclusive recovery from COVID-19. My name is Chad Blackman, the ambassador of Barbados to the WTO and chair of the WTO committee on trade and environment. I have the great pleasure of being your moderator today. We are particularly delighted that so many of you can join us both on Zoom and on the social media live stream. This event is organized by the WTO and UNEP as part of their collaboration to promote dialogue between the trade and environment communities. Today, we kick off WTO Trade and Environment Week 2020. Throughout the week, we will hold the fall meeting of the Committee on Trade and Environment, along with several events and workshops led by WTO members, many topics at the forefront of the trade and environment agenda, not least plastic pollution, climate change, natural disasters, and fossil fuel subsidy reform. I'm also very pleased to see a broad range of stakeholders engaging with WTO members this week. All this is an encouraging sign of the growing recognition within the WTO that trade is evolving as environmental risks, new technologies, and social pressures reshape the way we do business that the global trading system must adapt to the realities of the 21st century, and that the pressure to adapt can open new windows of opportunity for our work here at the WTO. The growing focus on sustainable trade at the WTO cannot arrive soon enough. We are confronting the most acute health crisis in a century and the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes. We need all hands on deck. And this includes WTO and UNEP working alongside all stakeholders. As I have said before, this is a ground zero moment. I cannot state that enough. This is a ground zero moment. Years of hard won development progress are being reversed. But the challenge before us is not simply to get back on track and recover the time loss to the crisis. Instead, we need to shift tracks towards a global economy that works for planet and people everywhere. Trade policies have a huge potential to support sustainability. They have a huge potential to help us to build back better. And they have a huge potential to propel us towards a greener and cleaner future that works for all. This potential can only be turned into reality if trade and environmental policies work in unison and not in discord. Secondly, trade and environment officials work in concert and not in silos. And thirdly, and importantly, trade and environment goals are perceived as mutually supportive, not in competition with each other. Moving in this direction is a big ask, but we are very fortunate to have with us a very, very distinguished panel to help us chart a way forward. I'm very pleased to introduce our two hosts. Inger Anderson, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of UN Environment Program, and Alan Wolf, the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. Both of them will share the panel with a group of top global uh, leaders and thinkers. We have Soraya Hakuzi Yaremi, excuse me, Minister of Trade and Industry from Rwanda. Andrea Meza Murillo, Minister of Environment and Energy from Costa Rica. Dame Ellen MacArthur, Founder and Chair of Trustees of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And we also have Jamshid Godrej, Chairman of the Board of the Godrej and Boyce Manufacturing Company Limited in India. We are honored to have you with us today. Before we start, let me say a few words about how I plan to conduct this meeting. My intention is to ask two rounds of questions to our panelists. I would kindly ask them to keep their answers short between three to four minutes at most, so that we then have time for questions from our audience. To those of you participating on Zoom, 
you may use the question and answer button to send your questions. This event is being live streamed on social media, so you may also post questions there. I remind participants on Zoom that we have simultaneous interpretation in the three WTO official languages, namely English, French, and Spanish. Now, at this time, I will give the floor to our executive director uh, from UNEP, Director Anderson, uh, and simply to respond to the question of, in your strategy, you talk about addressing the triple crisis of climate instability, nature loss and pollution arising from unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. So the question there for you is what role could you see trade playing in addressing these three crises and more importantly, their underlying causes? Executive Director, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ambassador Blackman. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here today and to uh, co-host uh, with our dear friends in WTO this very important event. Um, we're very pleased with this long-standing partnership that we have with WTO. Uh, Professor Blackman mentioned these three cri crises, planetary crisis, crisis of climate, the crisis of waste and pollution, and the crisis of nature's or biodiversity. And it's important that we understand that these crises are driven by our unsustainable consumption and production. So to get at solving these crises, we need to talk about sustainable consumption and production. And here trade plays an absolutely critical uh, factor. Uh, trade contributes to the crisis, but trade can also help solve the crisis. And, and, and it's the same with policies. Trade policies have good and bad impacts on the environment and environmental policies have good and bad impacts on trade. And we sort of need to unpack this. Just today, uh, we at UNEP, together with the panel, the International Resources Panel, that we are very proud to host, we are launching a new report that speaks to the material footprints of trade. Uh, and, and I wanted to mention in the few minutes here what it is that these findings are, because that's where we see the relevance uh, to the question that Ambassador Blackman proposed. We see this very high and increasing dependence of the affluent nations, of course, on the resource base and the manufacturing capacity in poorer nations. And if we consider a whole of life cycle of traded products, trade is responsible for much larger footprints if we take, when we look at material extraction than just the direct trade uh, indicates. In, in 2017, indirect uh, or embodied trade in materials, which to us refers to the materials, the energy, the water, the land use that are used in the extraction and production of traded goods. If we look at that, then um, across nations, then it was by a factor of three greater than just the regular traded uh, materials footprint. And, and that drives a high impact on biodiversity or nature, if you like, on pollution and waste, as well as on climate. So we need to make some shifts that can get to more to that circularity that can alter the flows between countries. And we need to understand that we need to do that in a way that leaves no one behind. Because if we're gonna reduce uh, extraction for consumption in the economy and then rejection back into the environment as waste and rather create circularity, well, it may lead to slower growth in primary raw materials. It may increase the trade in secondary raw materials, secondhand goods, and goods for manufacturing. Um, but And so that's something that we need to take into account as we think about these things. But it could also lead to new services like uh, sophisticated waste management, like sophisticated recycling, like refurbishment, like remanufacturing, especially if these goods are produced for remanufacturing. So the road of trade policy, understanding material footprint becomes really key. And there we would say that there are some areas that are long, long overdue, understanding um, what we need to do, for example, on fossil fuel uh, reform, 
um, in terms of uh, subsidies, understanding fisheries reform, and here WTO has a huge role to play on the fisheries subsidies side, and understanding harmful agricultural subsidies reform because each of these reforms that we need to do will have an impact on, on trade. Um, and finally, just because I know I'm running out of time, Ambassador, one last point. We released a report um, two, three weeks ago on used vehicles, and it's quite a, a, a trade in used vehicle. Now, there's nothing wrong with secondhand vehicles, provided that they're up to the standard. But what's happening is that Europe, US, and Japan are exporting masses amount of substandard, do not mean standard at home vehicles, uh, half of which go into Africa, the other half into Asia and Latin America. And these vehicles are precisely the kind of trade that we need to get at, uh, heightening regulatory settings, ensuring that they are roadworthy so they do not cause accidents, but also ensure that they are not um, uh, uh, emitting uh, illegally, which they are today, and which they would not be allowed in the roads from on the roads from which they came. The same, and I know Ellen is here, so I'm not going to go into plastic because she will speak to that so eloquently. But here we have a, a very important priority as well: talking about plastics in trade, getting it on the right track, and understand the export from wealthier countries of plastics waste and what that does to poorer countries. But I know that Ellen will speak to that and I'm now beyond my four minutes. So I will stop here, Ambassador, over to you. Thank you very much, Executive Director, for your presentation and intervention. Uh, quite timely, uh, what you would have shared with us. Now, at this time, I will head over to uh, Deputy Director General Wolf. Uh, who I, I will ask the question, and pretty much what uh, we would like to know is that this year, uh, 2020, has seen the most acute health crisis in a century, and equally at the same time, the worst economic crisis, certainly in our lifetimes. The question, therefore, uh, for you, uh, DDG, is why is it important to put focus on sustainable trade, particularly at this time, in our juncture in the world. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Blackman, and uh, I much appreciate the uh, 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 statement by Executive Director Anderson. On behalf of the WTO, I join in uh, extending a warm welcome uh, to our distinguished speakers and those of you around the world uh, joining this program today. Uh, the first reason why we should consider uh, the um, a situation with respect to sustainable development and uh, the, the uh, environmental condition of the planet uh, is because we're really facing two crises, not one at the same time. One is, uh, of course, the pandemic and recovery from it, uh, economic recovery, health recovery. The other is also existential as a crisis, uh, and that is with respect to uh, uh, how we shape the future of humankind with respect to uh, the planet um, and its environment. The pandemic has become a stark reminder that nature, uh, human health, and the economy are not separate. They're intimately connected. Scientists tell us that environmental degradation, not least biodiversity loss and climate change, will make potential zoonotic outbreaks like COVID-19 more common in the future. This assessment has enormous implications for the trading system, in fact, for the whole global economy. The disruption and immense suffering caused by COVID-19 foreshadows the costly damages that climate change may inflict on all countries, especially the poorest. So trade officials can't remain oblivious to that reality. A second reason, why is it important to put a focus on sustainable trade now, is that trade policies have a strong potential to affect the much needed economic recovery. The right trade policies would help us not only get back on track and recover some of the time lost to the crisis from an economic perspective, but also to shift toward a more sustainable and inclusive future. When trade and environmental policies work in concert, they help unlock opportunities for workers and businesses. When trade and environmental policies work in concert, 
They help make green goods and services better and more affordable. Already, solar energy is becoming the cheapest source of electricity generation in many parts of the world. When trade and environmental policies work in concert, they help create green and decent jobs. 80 million jobs are expected in renewable energy and energy efficiency worldwide by 2050. The third reason why we must focus on sustainable trade is that times of crisis often open windows of opportunity for action. The world is in crisis once again, and we now have an opportunity to respond by reforming the World Trade Organization. The WTO's founders saw sustainable development as a goal of the WTOs 25 years ago, and global trade cooperation as a means to unleash growth, alleviate poverty, raise living standards, and ensure full, appointment, uh, full employment. Future generations will judge how well we did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General Wolf, for your uh, preliminary remarks uh, to us. I'll now head over to uh, Minister Mizzo. Uh, Minister, we would have heard uh, broad support for considering environmental priorities in our COVID-19 recovery plans. From the perspective of your country, how do we ensure that we take into account environmental priorities, whilst at the same time allowing governments to fulfill other priorities, not least on jobs and livelihoods. More broadly, uh, the question is, is there a trade-off between uh, environment and trade priorities? Minister Meza. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and it's a pleasure of being here and, and sharing this important panel. The first remark is that there are no trade-offs if we have the right policies. And the first element is to really see that environmental issues are part of development models. And we need to have a whole of a government and whole of society approaches to address this. And, and it is possible. I will say that right now what we are seeing is that we can be uh, building this new economy, which it could be circular, green, blue, orange, based on innovation and the generation of decarbonized, digitalized, decentralized goods and services that at the same time could allow us to change our production and consumption patterns. Um, I think that uh, in the case of Costa Rica, for example, we managed to achieve our development model uh, from an agro-export model to one based on trade opening and export of non-conventional goods and services, generating welfare and new industries, and at the same time, reducing deforestation and generating electricity with renewable sources. And this is from a developing country doing and applying the right policies. Um, Costa Rica is currently leading um, a high value added services in Latin America. More than 250 high tech companies have presence in the country and 88% of the exported goods are non-conventional. And as I was saying, at the same time, we also uh, implemented uh, right policies from this sustainable perspective and we uh, stopped deforestation and we generated a new industry, which was um, tourism. So I will say that this comprehensive approach, uh, it is critical for this transformation and these inter, um, all these interlinkages between environment and trade are critical for this, for this transformation. And, um, and I would like to um, close these remarks just saying that we need to continue with this kind of webinars. We need to continue with this kind of interactions. So I really thank um, Inger and I really thank the, the uh, WTO um, interaction because it is so positive to continue having these building blocks together that will allow us to uh, this transformation and stop this idea of saying that there is a trade-off between uh, these commercial approaches and the environment. Thank you, Ambassador. 
Thank you very much, Minister Meza. And certainly uh, one thing that stuck out um, from your presentation, as you just concluded, is that there is no trade-off between uh, if we're getting it right once we have the right priorities, and that must be clear, and that we must certainly take a whole-of-government and whole-of-society approach. Now, I will now go to our next member of the panel, uh, Mr. Godrej, who uh, I've, I'm curious to, to find out. Uh, in terms of from a business perspective, we often hear from companies that uh, complying with ambitious environmental regulation is a drag on business competitiveness, particularly with foreign competitors uh, who are subject to less stringent regulation. So the question therefore is, how do you see the interaction between trade, environmental regulation and competitiveness from the perspective of a truly global company like Godrez? You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and fellow panelists and friends. Uh, I'm actually uh, you know, very positive about the role of business and environment. I feel that uh, even though when we look at the past of uh, what damage business has done to the environment, I also feel that businesses have a very strong role in making a change uh, for the better. Uh, of course, this has to be done both from a regulation point of view and from a voluntary point of view. I think both are very necessary. High standards are essential in order to be able to be more ambitious. Let me give you just a few examples uh, in India uh, of what businesses uh, have done and are doing. For instance, uh, even though the cement industry is well known to be uh, highly resource intensive as well as uh, energy intensive, the cement industry has for many, many decades now worked in India to reduce their footprint and to become more energy efficient. And I'm happy to say that the cement industry in India is today amongst the most uh, competitive and most environmentally uh, sustainable uh, uh, of all countries in the world. And this is an achievement that has been achieved uh, only because industry realized that to be competitive uh, and to reduce cost, they had to constantly reduce their footprint, uh, both on energy and resources. And this has been uh, a very good example of an industry association coming together together with uh, other uh, industry bodies of actually making that happen. Another good example uh, from India is on in energy standards for home appliances. You know, this, uh, this is something that was uh, fairly new to India and to Indian consumers. And uh, I think businesses initially were somewhat skeptical about uh, how consumers would be able to uh, adopt to this, but, uh, you know, when it was shown to consumers that a high star, that is a five star refrigerator, you know, or a five star air conditioner, uh, you know, if you compare that to a one star or a two star, the energy saving over the life of the appliance, you know, say five years or so, uh, was more than adequate to pay for the extra premium. I think you have to have uh, economic uh, ideas to present to consumers, which are both good for business, they're good for the environment, uh, and uh, you know, they're good for, uh, for everyone uh, in that process. So I think we have to find the so-called win-win-win uh, position uh, for the environment and industry and for uh, economies as a whole. Uh, it's not easy, of course, and it cannot be, and is not so in every sector. But I think the more we talk about it as to how businesses benefit uh, from these environment standards, I think the sooner we will get to these. As far as trade is concerned, I find that uh, you know, the India feels uh, very often to be at the receiving end uh, uh, of threats that uh, there would be uh, sanctions on trade, et cetera, if they are not compliant with certain uh, regulations. But I don't see this as a threat. I see this as an opportunity. I think that given enough time and, and reasonable regulations, 
I think it would be beneficial for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Godrej. And what um, stuck out with me, I must say, is that there certainly has to be a new thinking uh, for us as a global trade and environment community, that there is a very clear nexus between uh, the business community, the environment community, and the consumers. And if we can find that crossroad between the three, then we're going to start to see the gains that we would like to see accrued in this regard. Thank you very much. I will now head over to uh, our next panelist, Dame Ellen MacArthur. Uh, and Dame, uh, for you, um, my question is, both UNEP and the WTO have partnered for several years uh, on the issue of uh, trade and sustainable uh, development. Yet, clearly, the context has changed in light of uh, COVID-19 and its economic and social impacts. What do you consider uh, to be the most promising avenues for future collaboration in supporting greener recoveries? If you can unmute, perfect. My apologies. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'd like to begin by talking about the fact that the COVID-19 crisis has brought a deep economic problem to the world. Um, as we've heard about already in this session, uh, greater than we've come across before. And when we look at climbing out of a deep crisis, what we need to do is look at opportunities. We need to hang on to opportunities. And what we've seen so often in the past is those opportunities have been created by an extractive economy, a linear economy, one where we take a material out of the ground, we make something out of it, and ultimately it gets thrown away. And the way we grow that economy is by extracting more and making more. But we know that in the long term, that can't run. And we've seen through the COVID-19 crisis, some of the implications of these incredibly brittle supply chains that we have across the world. They're very, very fine and they go a very, very long way. When you look at solutions, you need to look at opportunities. And with the circular economy, from the outset, you build an economy which is restorative and regenerative. Actually, you make the economy, as we've heard in previous speeches, you make it the solution rather than part of the problem. So as the economy grows, as the economy speeds up, as the economy picks up, you begin to solve the problem with the economy itself. And with the circular economy, through designing out waste and pollution from the outset, through uh, regenerating natural systems and through keeping products and materials at their highest value at all times. We've done many studies at the foundation, many in co cooperation with some of the organizations here, looking at the economic value of, a, of an, a circular economy. And we find there is significant economic value in shifting from that linear extractive model to that one which is circular, where it's regenerative and restorative, where we really see value being created, not through extraction, but through building. This is about building, not, not knocking things down. And it's a big mental shift, a design shift, it's a financing shift, it's a policy shift. Of course, there's a very, very strong trade element there because we live very much in a globalized world. So I'd like to end there. I'll come on to plastics in my second piece. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Dame, uh, for that uh, in intervention. At this time, I will uh, introduce and we will go to our minister, Minister Kuzi uh, Yaremye. Uh, and my question to you, Minister, we have heard from international organizations. Now, I would like to bring the national perspective uh, again, because we would also heard from our minister in Costa Rica. Rwanda is making important efforts to incorporate sustainability into the broader developmental strategy. The question is then, how can you as trade minister support efforts uh, to protect and more sustainably use of nature? And also what challenges does the global pandemic pose in this regard? Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. And I wanted to thank um, UNEP and the WTO for the invitation. Um, as you know, as uh, the many challenges that the developing countries uh, encounter, and I think Minister Meza uh, touched upon it, is how do we industrialize, but also making sure that we already use um, environment-friendly uh, strategies and technologies. 
And at uh, policy level, um, the government of Rwanda has already put in place um, policies and strategies to make sure that as we build our manufacturing sector, as we um, get integrated into global trade, we really put environment at the center of our development. Uh, for instance, one of the program we've worked on in the past 10 years, uh, which was a program initiated by UNEP and uh, also the UN Industrialization Development Organization, UNIDO, was the resource efficient and cleaner production uh, program, which helps our industries to achieve um, uh, not only uh, use the resources efficiently, but make sure that they can already acquire technologies that are environment friendly. Um, and, and we also continue to sensitize our company, our companies on the benefits of uh, cleaner production technologies. And so far in the, in the last 10 years, uh, 134 industries have gone through that program where we have seen benefits in terms of um, reduction in, in, in CO2 emissions, uh, solid waste reduction, uh, but also investment projects that are geared to, towards already embracing environment friendly uh, production, su such as industrial briquettes, which we have uh, put in place as well, an e-waste, electronic waste uh, management project. Uh, and, and, and these are some of the initiatives that as we developed uh, our manufacturing sector, we've put in place to ensure um, that, that uh, environment friendly uh, strategies are the heart of our, um, of our uh, development. But challenges are many uh, because we need uh, not only financial resources, but also technological resources to be able to, uh, I would say, balance um, uh, development, but also uh, impact uh, on environment. And especially what we've seen as uh, we are trying to really also support our companies uh, to acquire technologies that are environment friendly, it's not always easy, especially for our, our um, our small and medium-sized companies to mobilize funds required to acquire those acquisition, those technology, which is why I think we continue as a government to also invest and co-invest with these companies uh, so that they can uh, acquire the best technology at the outset and not really um, trying to, 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 to develop our industries, but ignoring um, the, uh, the environment uh, um, the environment impact of some of the industries. If I take one example, for instance, we are um, a country that's really pursuing uh, investment uh, in uh, industries um, for construction material industries, uh, which some of which are, are really very polluting. So having to um, sort of uh, refuse some of the investments where we need these are materials that we need is not always easy at policy level. Um, however, this is a choice that as a government we have made. Uh, and I would uh, maybe uh, also end with one example when Rwanda uh, 12 years ago uh, put in place a ban on plastic bags. Um, this was something that a lot of critics were saying that it should not be a priority for our country because if we don't have alternative packaging, then it's also sort of punishing uh, the population. But when we see 12 years down the road, uh, what, what that has, uh, the impact it has had not only on our environment, but also our urbanization, uh, I think it's something that it was a tough choice to make, but in the long run paid off. And this is the strategy that we're also putting in place as we continue to develop our industrial um, sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I, I certainly agree with you on the point uh, that there is a need, particularly when you're looking at the issue of transitioning companies from one mode of uh, engagement to another, particularly for smaller and uh, medium-sized enterprises. The financing of that is going to be critical, uh, and also the refinancing. And I think now, particularly on this forum, it is quite useful to have this dialogue because there has to be an inter-organizational dialogue to ensure that the overall financing and refinancing architecture allows for this transition for the companies throughout the world to make this uh, shift, particularly at this time. Uh, and when you add the uh, elements of, of COVID and all of the implications thereafter. So thank you very much for that intervention. I, I'd now like to get back to uh, Executive Director Anderson. Uh, 
to, to also answer the, the question that I would have posed uh, earlier to one of our other panelists, in terms of the, the partnerships between uh, UNEP, for example, and the WTO, and therefore, uh, what do you consider the most promising avenues for future collaboration uh, in supporting greener recoveries, particularly at this time where we are in the world? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, obviously, we are very committed to our partnership with WTO. And I think um, all the more so when we've seen this shock that the pandemic has caused. And as we say in UNEP, sad but true, um, the, pan the pandemic shock is but an overture of what future environmental shocks will be if we do not take action. So we need action across all sectors, including on the trade sector. And here, um, clearly, um, f first and foremost, on the national, <coughs> excuse me, on the national level, <coughs> having ministers of environment and trade engage together. <coughs> I'm very sorry. Um, <coughs> so that becomes absolutely critical. I'm just going to take a glass of that. And so <coughs> to ensure that uh, trade policies and environmental policies are working together. You know, Ambassador, I'm going to ask you to pass over. Yes, please. That's else. no problem. We'll come back Thank you me. very much. Uh, we'll come back to you. That's no problem. Um, but, what, but one thing I, I do want to pick up uh, from you, Executive Director, is the whole aspect of action across all sectors. It is a, a, a very relevant consideration that we as the international community, particularly at this time, have to engage in. Because for a long time, there has been a, a thinking that it's either a government issue or it's an environmental uh, issue, and sometimes it's a private sector issue. But now it's very, very clear, particularly in what we've seen this year, there has to be an all sector approach as we move forward. We will now go to uh, our DDG in the WTO. And, and the question for you, DDG, I have is what, therefore, in light of what we've heard, is the WTO uh, doing concretely to make trade work better uh, for the planet, for people, and also overall the prosperity and support efforts to build back greener and to build back stronger and to build back even better. Thank you very much, Ambassador Blackman. Uh, I much appreciate uh, the, the interventions that have taken place to date on uh, this uh, webinar. Um, I'd highlight three areas where the WTO has acted in support of sustainable trade. Uh, the most formal, of course, is the launch of fishery negotiations to curb uh, harmful fishery subsidies. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to an agreement before too long uh, that would help protect the world's marine environment. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, all countries are affected by the fish stocks being depleted but some are affected more than others, especially developing countries that rely upon uh, fish stocks in their areas, uh, which are being fished out uh, through the use of uh, large vessels that are subsidized. Um, so we need to know that those negotiations will succeed and deliver results soon. Uh, secondly, 90 WTO members have engaged in making trade rules fit for the global economy, uh, in the global digital economy. There are countless ways in which the digital economy serves and will serve the environment, uh, delivering sustainable agriculture, reducing pollution, forecasting weather. Uh, trade makes these tools available across borders. Uh, there are many examples in uh, developing countries, including the least developed countries, where digital technologies are uh, a major advantage in uh, reducing the use of pesticides, in uh, increasing crop yields, uh, and uh, uh, all to the, to the benefit of the environment. In the not too distant past, um, we had a negotiation here through 2016 that was suspended on in the environmental goods agreement. Uh, we have to get back to that. And that would be duty-free trade for environmental goods. Uh, we should also look to environmental services. Those needed in the transition to a clean circular economy as has been emphasized by uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur and uh, other, other speakers. Uh, machines to sort waste and break down hard to cycle materials, 
uh, along with critical inputs to produce biodegradable plastics, uh, shouldn't be subject to tariffs. Uh, insulation materials for energy efficient buildings and water saving equipment to help farmers adapt to more frequent droughts uh, and key components for smart grids and weather forecasting instruments. Uh, we should also redouble efforts to restart and conclude uh, these negotiations soon. Uh, the second area where the WTO has acted to promote uh, is to promote dialogue and cooperation. Uh, the WTO was designed to provide a place for members to deliberate, to solve problems, to meet challenges. The last few years has seen an increase in activity with respect to the environment, uh, particularly in the Committee on Trade and Environment, which uh, Ambassador Blackman chairs. Serious engagement on pressing issues has helped to improve transparency, build trust and cooperation, and raise awareness of the growing impact of climate risks on the way we do business and trade. Uh, the CTE, the Committee on Trade and Environment, is dedicated to promoting a better understanding of what these developments mean for trade and how the WTO should respond. Uh, some examples, uh, trade in the circular economy has been raised as a serious question for deliberation, and I hope moving towards uh, active consideration of proposals, how to strengthen supply chains that make recycling and other resource savings activities uh, efficiently, uh, efficient and safe. Uh, the removal of environmentally harmful distortions, including an initiative by a group of WTO members to reform fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, I, I accepted on behalf of the WTO a declaration at um, Buenos Aires on that subject. I expect that to come back as a major issue. Uh, particularly important uh, and more advanced are initiatives by a group of members to intensify, intensify work on trade and plastic pollution to start structured discussion towards concrete trade action on environmental sustainability. Both initiatives will be launched tomorrow. Third area of the WTO I would highlight is inclusiveness, which is essential if we want to make progress on sustainable trade. The WTO's Aid for Trade initiative provides a good foundation for sustainable inclusive trade, and it can galvanize investment to boost the ability of the smallest and poorest countries to benefit from the rapidly expanding greener economy. Aid for Trade helps small and medium enterprises in developing countries to meet new standards so they can be part of a climate-friendly uh, series of circular value chains. WTO members have shown growing interest in greening Aid for Trade as a program of the $340 billion dispersed under this program from 2006 to 2016, one third, fully a third, has been allocated to projects with an environmental goal. And I think that's going to increase over time. And earlier this year, WTO members endorsed a new work program for the next biennium, which identifies the circular economy as a focus area. For these purposes, the WTO and UNIT decided to join forces and bring trade and environmental communities closer together. And today's event is another sign of our positive collaboration, which is very welcome on the part of the WTO. I am, and our members, I am very encouraged by the strong commitment from our members to turn their vision of sustainable trade into reality. This is a time for action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General. This is a time for action indeed. And you touch on a number of critical uh, points. Uh, certainly, the relooking and the redoubling of efforts towards uh, an environmental goods agreement could not uh, come at an, uh, an even better time, given where we are in the world. Uh, and also, the issue of uh, reform on fossil fuel subsidies continues to be engaging members' attention. But I think in light of the current circumstances, perhaps we have to hunker down and press uh, towards that direction uh, uh, in not too distant future. I'd like to invite Executive Director Anderson again uh, to give her intervention. Executive Director. Thank you, and I do apologize. I don't know what happened there, but thank you very much. So just to follow up exactly where uh, the De Deputy Executive Director Wolf was speaking to, it's really critical that we now bring together the trade and the environment community 
not just at the global level, but also at the regional level and at the national level. A lot has been done in a number of countries, much yet to be done in many countries. And I think that when we do so, we'll be able to support uh, capacity building in developing countries to develop trade policies that can advance both the environmental side as well as uh, trade opportunities. And, and in this context, we, we speak about these four priorities. First being, yes, bring the ministers together. Secondly, really talking about, and again, uh, Mr. Wolf spoke to that, the greening of the aid for trade and understanding that um, taxing some of these things and having those kind of um, tariffs on some of these elements is not helping where we want to reach renewable energy, low carbon transportation systems, resilient infrastructure, sustainable agriculture, sustainable supply chains. These are the things we want to see. And for a number of countries, it's very hard to get there. I will say that business is leaning in. Business is asking us to help at the national level set standards. Uh, we heard that, I think, from Mr. Godre, when there is an, a, 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 a level playing field, business can play and they understand that if, if we have government standards that speak to circularity, speak to performance, speak to the percentage recycle, speak to, but not downcycling, recycling, <laughs> uh, speak to uh, repairability, all of those elements allow for something. So that's my second point. But third, we must ensure that any trade agreement is aligned with the environmental agreements that that country has already signed, right? So understanding therefore what the trade agreement means for whether it's bilateral or multilateral immaterial, that what that means for the Paris Agreement commitments that the country has made, the biodiversity, i.e. the biodiversity convention, CITES, CMS, any other uh, uh, convention agreement, uh, a Basel, of course, which limits the trade and hazardous materials. Um, so each of these, and I fear that uh, because we have at, in many countries have, have not had the, the integration between environment and trade, that, that we are not as well informed across the aisle as we should be. And the fourth thing is that we need to really see leadership uh, at the national level. And here, this kind of debate and discussion is exactly what enables that because it is that multilateral dialogue that can ensure that we understand and, and, and can have a dialogue across the aisle. And let me also say that China, Fiji, Barbados, Australia, Morocco, are some of the countries that are really leading on the discussion around plastic pollution and trade. We salute that, we look to more crowding in, um, and we're very interested in this new proposal of extended Friends of Action of Sustainable Trade or the FAST, um, and seeing how we can move that forward. And from our side, just to say that we are very pleased with the partnership that we have with WTO on economics and, and, and trade. Um, and we, we see that at the upcoming UNIA, which will now be postponed, of course, in view of COVID, um, that this is an issue that we will very much continue to push so that we can, from UNIP's side, address these three planetary crises, the, the, the crisis of the climate, the crisis of pollution and waste, the crisis of nature, which are, as I said in the beginning, caused by our unsustainable consumption and production. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Executive Director. You, you really gave us some food for thought there. And one thing that is very, very clear, and I completely agree with you, is that there has to be now the compatibility between uh, trade agreements and environmental agreements, because hitherto there has been this raison d'etre or thinking in the global community that the trade issues are on the left and the environmental issues are on the right and the two never uh, coming together. But now we're seeing more and more the need for there to be that compatibility between the two. And I think also the issue of getting conversations like this, not just in terms of uh, panel discussions, but actually getting our negotiators uh, in terms of our trade environment and trade specialists and environmental specialists having that dialogue more and more together will become very, very, very critical in order for us to see the gains that we are looking to, to achieve in that regard. Uh, before I, I go to our next panelist, uh, Minister Meza, let me uh, say to our uh, persons online, now is the time if you want to pose questions for you to send them in so that the Secretariat
can have them, and then we will take it from there. So at this point, uh, I will go to Minister Mazur. Uh, Minister, you have heard from the DDG that a growing number of WTO members have stressed the need for the WTO to contribute to addressing uh, climate resilience, uh, nature, loss, and plastic pollution. From your experience as the current Vice President of the Uni5, uh, how can the environment community engage with other relevant actors, not least the trade community, uh, in finding workable and effective solutions for the triple uh, planetary challenges uh, of pollution, climate, and nature? And also, what are the most compelling priorities uh, in your mind uh, for you and the uh, overall UN Environment Assembly? Thank you, Ambassador. And it's to continue with this systemic approach. Uh, this is the critical element. Um, the theme for UNIA 5 is strengthening actions to protect nature, to achieve the sustainable development goals. And again, to have this systemic and whole of a government approach is a critical element. And it is the, the way that we must continue to reinforce. Um, but it is, it is of course uh, critical that we um, um, break these silos, um, mode of works and bring together these uh, two communities that we have been saying uh, environment and trade, but not only environment and trade, but also businesses and consumers. And um, this is why Costa Rica and Norway, we support the necessity of having a strong ministerial declar declaration with a strong political message at the, addressing this integrated approach at the UNEA 5, and also to continue working with a specific resolutions on chemical management, nature-based solutions, marine litter and microplastics, among others. But this is just one of the elements that we were saying. And, and I think it is critical also to try to implement practical examples of, of how can we implement this integrated approach. And I would like to share with you one example. Um, Costa Rica and Norway, uh, the two countries that are represented at the NEA Bureau, are also working together in the, um, uh, with WTO and are both active participants in the negotiation of an agreement on climate uh, change, trade and sustainability. We, what we are calling ACTS, along with New Zealand, Iceland, Switzerland and Fiji. Uh, all policy levers are needed to drive the transformation uh, that, I, that it is requires to a low emission, climate resilient and sustainable economies. Um, and these in the acts will address trade policy rules and architecture in order to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and to facilitate uh, increased trade contributing to sustainable development. I think that what it is very interesting with acts is that it is a very, uh, it is an innovation that we are talking about the removal of tariffs on environmental goods, but not only on that, but also on establishment of, of disciplines to eliminate harmful fossil fuel subsidies to development of guidelines to inform the development and implementation of voluntary eco-labeling programs and mechanisms. Uh, the treaty level instrument will be open to other countries to, um, that would like to contribute in this, in this integrated manner. And what is happening right now in the field is this interaction between the environmental community and the trade community working together to build this new, um, this new agreement. So we are very um, happy on the, this uh, journey that we are starting with all these countries working together to have this, this kind of agreement. And, and we think that this is the kind of elements that we need to show to demonstrate that we are committed, that it is possible, the technologies are there. And as how we are been hearing, um, we need concrete and new policies. We need also voluntary standards. And, and then we will be able to engage with the private sector once we have these enabling conditions. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank, thank you very much, Minister. What's becoming clearer more and more as we, we go on through this uh, panel 
is that there has to be collaboration between all stakeholders, whether that be um, between governments and private sector, or whether that be uh, between intergovernmental organizations. There has to be that uh, whole of society approach, if, if I should use your term, to ensure that we reach our targets within a very uh, clear and well-defined time period and with a very clear and well-defined roadmap as well. I'd now go over to uh, Minister Hakuzi Yaremye. Uh, Minister, you have heard the perspectives from UNEP and the WTO. And from your perspective, how can trade uh, WTO uh, and UNEP help a country like Rwanda build back greener and better in light of the circumstances of COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. I think um, as it stands now, uh, the, the main challenges that we have uh, seen uh, for our private sector and trade in general um, as, as, as a result of, of COVID and the uh, disruption of supply chains, uh, especially for a country like Rwanda, uh, which is also landlocked, the, the, the impact was, was really substantial. Um, however, I think... Um, where we would need um, more support uh, being from UNEP uh, or WTO is one, uh, you know, any support to our manufacturing, because as we, as a continent, we enter into a continental free trade area, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which will uh, come into force and start where we start trading um, on the continent, uh, I would say um, in, in a free trade area on the 1st of January next year, is that of course countries have to have products to, to exchange, meaning the, the, the production of those products has to already embed um, technologies that are uh, climate friendly and environmental friendly and uh, where we really need, I think, to uh, keep working with, with UNEP, but also WTO as we implement that free uh, trade area agreement. Um, and, and I think uh, the support to access technology, but also have experts that look at uh, how we can prevent um, you know, the generation of industrial waste and harmful emissions as we uh, we, we, we open up more and more to, to more industries and, and more manufacturing capacities um, and, and how to enhance really the use of our resources. Um, you know, uh, a lot have been talked about, about the use of uh, renewable energy, for instance, um, and, 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 and the use of, of local materials in construction as well, so that we can avoid, you know, unnecessary carbon emissions from unnecessary imports. And I think that's where really we think, um, you know, we, we have to work with our international partners uh, to ensure that we continue to sort of advocate, um, I would say a parallel, um, you know, uh, be it industrialization, but also um, a keen um, and, and, and deliberate uh, um, environment-friendly fr policies and strategies uh, on our development growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Very, very clear. And advocacy for a parallel track. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, we will go over to our panelists, uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur. Uh, Dame, you would have spoken earlier about the promise of moving between, um, or moving towards rather, a circular economy. Now, what are the barriers that you see that might prevent companies, for example, from embracing uh, circular business practices? And equally, uh, is there a role for trade and trade policy uh, to help us to overcome these specific barriers uh, that exist? Thank you, Ambassador. There are absolutely barriers out there. And one thing we've heard mentioned several times in this webinar today has been the enabling conditions, the level playing field, and the need for systemic change. And we, for many years now, have worked on the subject of plastic packaging with some of, in fact, most of the biggest companies in the world who produce it. And what we found very early on in the conversation was that they cannot fix it on their own. They need to know what they're working towards because you need the system to change. And that means they have to shift together with their biggest competitors. So of course, setting the level playing field. And in fact, perhaps most importantly, agreeing what the goal is 
is absolutely fundamental. And when we worked with the United Nations Environment Programme to create the global commitment, which we now have 20% of the global plastic packaging industry signed up to, we were incredibly clear with what that goal was. And that enables people to work towards a different type of material or a different type of distribution model. That was to make all plastic pa packaging reusable, recyclable, or compostable by 2025. So that's a very, very clear goal. And we've seen along the subject of trade, the importance of shift in trade. When China stopped importing um, plastic waste, 50% stayed in Europe, 50% got sent to other countries. So immediately there was a disruption in that trade of plastic waste. But I was thinking about this conversation a few days ago and I was thinking actually, when we send plastic waste into a country, it is already waste. The definition of that plastic material is waste, but actually what the WTO is incredibly good at doing is setting definitions. And if you go one step back and you think of the plastic pollution problems globally, actually, if you import into a country a small plastic, a small format sachet of shampoo or washing powder, that will only ever become waste in that country once that sachet is opened, because there is no way of reprocessing that material in that country. So actually, when we talk about importing waste, we're used to talking of end of pipe waste, such as what goes from our bins here in Europe that used to go to China. But actually, waste could go one step back as can you actually send something into a country that you know it can only ever become waste in that territory? And I think it's interesting just to see at what point do we define a product under a certain name and how, therefore, does that product arrive in a country to be processed? within that country. So the processing capacity, maybe something needs to be compostable, maybe it's a different distribution model, but that actually is very much dictated by trade rules, what can come in and what can go out. So I'll, I'll end on that on plastic, but I think it's a, a fascinating topic to explore. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Dame, for, for that uh, response. And, and in terms of the whole issue of capacity, that is very, very critical. When we're looking at the whole issue of uh, the circular economy, uh, a number of developing countries in the world would like to be and want to participate and understand the importance of um, the new sector. But for lack of resources, infrastructure and finance, they're unable to do so. But if we're talking about having the, the entire globe being part of this new circular economy, we therefore have to find a very clear mechanism that allows for the developing world particularly to, to fully engage. And I, and I think it brings us back also to the point that I would have also raised earlier about the financing mechanism um, that will have to drive the new thrust of the global economy. So I thank you very much for, for that intervention. Uh, moving to uh, Mr. Godridge. Now, finally, let me seek your views on a topic um, that is on the minds of many businesses, uh, particularly at this time. The question of resilience and sustainability of global value chains uh, to shocks. How does a company with a global reach like yours see the challenge of making global supply chains green, sustainable, and more resilient? Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think this is uh, one of those really difficult uh, questions. And uh, I think we recognize uh, very clearly that uh, you know, supply chains are both global as well as domestic. And uh, what I find is that influencing our own supply chain within our own country is uh, significantly simple compared to doing it uh, on a global level. Uh, I think we recognize that uh, many of our suppliers uh, don't actually know the type of standards that would be required from an environmental point of view, uh, not aware of it. And so a lot of that work has to be on building that awareness. And uh, until you have built the awareness and actually held their hands and work with them closely, you know, you will not actually see any benefits. We have over the last 10 years been able to influence all our suppliers supplying over 80% of the buy value of our appliance business, you know, in order to be able to meet those energy standards, the environment standards, et cetera. Yeah, I do agree that uh, plastic waste is still some uh, time away. And uh, so I won't comment on that, but 
I think that uh, uh, certainly when it comes to energy, uh, when it comes to recycling, uh, reducing waste, etc., these are entirely things which we can handle and do. And we can unify uh, the supply chain within India to do that. I think the bigger challenge that I have always seen is that standards, say between India and China, just as an example, you know, are very different. You know, expecting that uh, something that would come from China would meet an Indian requirement is a big challenge and vice versa. <clears throat> so I think until we see much more standardization uh, of uh, these types of uh, environment standards, it would be very difficult to, to green it. But one thing that we have seen is that uh, uh, there is a very uh, good recognition in India that uh, both energy and environment issues are critical to business. And we find that when we talk to our business colleagues, that uh, there is a, there's a good amount of acceptance. Uh, let me just talk of one sector, which, which where I've been greatly involved with, which is in uh, certified green buildings. You know, this is a journey which we started more than 15 years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, we have been able to convince builders, developers, owners of properties, et cetera, the benefits of having a certified green building. And today we have, you know, amongst the largest stock of certified green buildings in the world. And it happened because we were able to show the business case to the developer why a green building actually was better for them in the long run and in the short run. They were able to get more business, consumers were happier, uh, users were happier. You know, we, we conducted experiments to show that uh, you know, the air quality inside the building can actually be better than the air quality outside the building. I mean, these were sort of things that uh, we were able to show. So I think if you work you know, with, with the supply chain uh, on these issues, you will get uh, a good amount of traction. But I think my, my biggest uh, concern has been that there are many business sectors which are in some sense, uh, are not a monopoly, but could be a duopoly or it could be very few players in that industry. And getting them to change is much more difficult. So I have one thing I have seen is that we need much more competition, you know, whether it is domestic competition or international competition, because that is what really makes some uh, real change happen. You know, when you see your competitor getting some business because they have made that change, you know, I think it's a, it's a big, uh, uh, benefit for a green supply chain. In these uh, COVID times, you know, I think, uh, especially in, in India, uh, where our economy has been greatly uh, affected uh, because we had a complete lockdown for over three months. Uh, you know, I think that the, the number one issue has become jobs. And, uh, and so what we have been doing with a lot of our organizations here is working on how to bring back those green jobs, you know, which jobs are really going to help the environment and which jobs, you know, in some sense, of course you need jobs, but they are not. And so how do you influence that change to happen? And so we have done uh, a lot of work on seeing how we can bring back uh, good quality jobs and jobs which will further green uh, uh, the economy. Uh, and everywhere, Whenever we talk about this, I see we have a lot of uh, acceptance of it. Uh, I want to just uh, end uh, on, on something which I read about, uh, which, which really uh, in some ways raised some sort of a classical dilemma for me uh, when I heard about it. Uh, and I was happy to hear the Deputy Director General of WTO talk of the marine trade. And, uh, uh, you know, I read that uh, we are all uh, eagerly awaiting for a vaccine to, to take place. But I also read that maybe it is going to be uh, a slaughter of sharks because shark liver oil is one of the ingredients for the vaccine. Now this creates an, an enormous dilemma, uh, you know, on environmental issues uh, and sustainability issues along with uh, human lives and, and opening up economies. And these are the sort of classic uh, 
issues I think that uh, you know we do have to work on together to find solutions for. You know, I I really don't know how how whether there are alternates for shark oil or not, but you know if it does result in in a massive uh, massacre of sharks in order to be able to get this ingredient for the vaccine, I mean I really don't know you know whether I want to have a vaccine at the end of the day or not. You know, these are the sort of uh, issues that we must think about because this is a, not just a global issue for everyone, the pandemic, but I think finding a vaccine and a solution is just as important, if not more. So let me end there. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your intervention and very well uh, thought out and articulated uh, position with regards to how do we take this, this forward. And it's very, very, very uh, important as you said, to at the onset get the uh, suppliers in the supply chain to come on board so that one, it minimizes cost, and two, they also see the benefits. And the ultimate beneficiaries are the cons is the consumer. And the, the sooner that we can get this approach going across the board, as I would have indicated earlier, I think the, the stronger a position we will be in. Now, we are at this stage in our uh, discussion today where the, uh, there's now a Q&A. We've received a high number uh, of questions for our panelists, uh, but we don't have a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, give one or two questions for all panelists to give their perspective on. And then if we have time, we will take another round of questions, failing that I will then, after the first round of questions have been uh, answered by our panel, I will then invite the panel once again to give their final uh, remarks, okay? Now, the question that I have for you, and all panelists can give their own uh, perspectives, is how will the WTO and trade officials uh, promote the mitigation of waste generated by the negative externalities due to the current global pandemic of COVID-19 vis-a-vis, we've seen the increased use, uh, necessarily so, of masks, of gloves, uh, and other uh, PPEs. So therefore, how will uh, we mitigate the negative externalities in light of this and the effects that it has have has have had sorry um, on the environment and continues to do so so i would invite uh minister Meza to give your intervention at this time thank you ambassador and then and i apologize because after this i need to to move to another meeting um, I will say that it is very critical to continue with this um, a specific negotiation of, of this uh, trade agreements. As I was saying, uh, these elements like acts give us a new opportunity uh, to having the coherence in our policies. And, and this is a critical element right now uh, to continue working in, in coherence of policies. Uh, this element of also seeing uh, environmental issues as part of development issues is a critical one. And we, were, we have been here in systemic approach and these need to be integrated also in, the, um, in our planning systems. And when we are talking about coherence in, in, our, in our countries, we need to uh, bring our planning ministries also, our finance ministries, and of course our trade ministries. And this ecosystem working together can generate the right uh, signals for the private sector, can generate the specific uh, regulations, and at the same time, the specific incentives. And I will say that we have been hearing the importance also of talking about not good subsidies, <laughs> and there, there is a, a conversation that we need to address on this, but also on the right incentives and the right uh, uh, tax elements that we need to consider. So I will say that these elements of, of talking about new trade agreements included environmental aspects and, and the type of elements that we want to address, but also carbon pricing. And I will say that probably nature destruction pricing, something like that, that we really need to include these elements in the kind of conversations and at the same time bring in the right incentives. It is part of this systemic approach 
and probably it's the type of work that we need to uh, continue uh, doing at the national level, at the local level, at the regional level, and of course at the international level. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you very much for the opportunity of having these reflections with you. Thank, thank you very much, Minister Mesa, for your, your, your reply and also for your participation. Uh, certainly, you have given us a lot of food for thought and, and well clear and well guided uh, roadmap for us to, to consider as we move forward, not just in the context of the Environment Week, but certainly as we move toward the ministerial uh, in Kazakhstan next year uh, and beyond. You've given us some very, very, very clear points on how we ought to engage between uh, the trade community and the environmental community. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much for your very rich and solid participation. I now then uh, give the floor to answer the same question uh, to our uh, second minister on, on the panel, uh, our minister from Rwanda. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I, I think here, uh, as, as we, you know, all countries um, work on, on economic recovery strategies, and, and I think the example given in, in the question was, how do we make sure that we minimize, for instance, the generation of wastes um, from, from um, PPEs or, or face masks and, 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 and the likes? Uh, one, we've seen that our... Um, uh, garment uh, companies uh, uh, saw this as an opportunity to continue working uh, when they were able to, to, to be certified and manufacture face masks uh, and PPEs and, and, and to, co to combat the spread of, of COVID in our country, which, which Rwanda really, we, we are we're very uh, grateful for, for uh, not only the leadership, but also the role of the population in ensuring that all measures put, put in place to prevent the spread of COVID were respected and we've uh, sort of contained uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, however, when we look at how I think, uh, if, if I go back to what uh, uh, my colleague, Minister Mesa was, uh, was referring to is uh, the planning of all that. Of course, the global crisis and the pandemic, uh, you know, took us by surprise and we had to adapt quickly. And now how do we make sure that we get rid of the waste created by face masks that people are wearing now? And second, uh, of course, when we discuss with the private sector on the recovery strategy, um, uh, costs and reducing costs in whatever investment they have uh, and trying to really contain also the resources they have, uh, we have to be careful of policymakers to not push down the priority lists uh, all the strategies we had for green growth, because now the priority is on, uh, you know, uh, making sure that uh, sort of we, we, we maintain and, and we, we minimize as much as possible uh, the impact of COVID-19 to our economy, uh, to, 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 to the, um, I would say, financial standing of, of our companies. And, and there's a tendency to sort of put now, uh, push back, all the investment needed for, for let's say, climate-friendly investments at, at, at the bottom of our priority list, which is something that we really, I think, as we work with, with the Ministry of Environment being Minister of Trade, to always now uh, also involve them in this economic recovery strategy so that the env environment part doesn't, uh, is not, uh, I would say, pushed aside by, by the uh, emergency and priorities that we have uh, to really sustain sustain our economy and, and make sure that we can minimize the impact of COVID on our companies. Last thing would be also, um, as we had invested as government, uh, being in, in solar energy, in hydropower plants, uh, and, 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 and resources of governments are now limited because they've been shifted to, uh, to, to the health sector. So how do we ensure that we don't lose momentum uh, and also um, in, in, in the use of renewable energy, which uh, in most developing countries have to be first and foremost invested in by government uh, in, in sort of de-risking strategies so that the private sector can come in as well. So we have a challenge on that. And I think uh, that's why we really need to work with development partners so that we can continue having the same funding that was geared to uh, renewable energy uh, um, uh, and, 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 and keep the momentum in, in, in having uh, those uh, energy sources uh, continue to be invested in. Thank you, Ambassador.
Okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your uh, thoughts and, and intervention uh, as well with regards to the question that we would have heard. Now, I'd like then to give the, the floor to uh, Mr. Godridge to, to give his uh, response as well. Uh, and then followed, we would have the uh, Executive Director uh, of UNEP, followed by DDG of WTO in that order to give their responses. Yep. Thereafter, thank you. Ellen Macar uh, Dame MacArthur. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, on this uh, issue of PPEs, uh, I do agree that uh, it is it is a major issue. But I, you know, for one, believe that uh, even though there's not much we may be able to do right away, but we really should have some sort of an innovation prize for, uh, you know, finding uh, how PPEs, face masks and other uh, equipment can really be made uh, fully recyclable uh, and uh, reusable. Uh, clearly, you know, it's going to be a major problem for a long time as to how to handle this. And I certainly hope it doesn't end up in uh, landfills. So, uh, 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 but I'm, I'm not sure as to whether this is really going to be one of the larger uh, sort of uh, tonnage of uh, plastics uh, uh, and materials that are used uh, for, as far as PPE is concerned. I'm sure that consumer goods will still be a much larger challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Godrej. I now give the floor to Executive Director Anderson, please. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And just to say that I very much agree with what Mr. Godrej is saying. Uh, clearly, it is the sort of mainstream waste that we need to deal with, notwithstanding the fact of COVID waste being very, very serious. We at UNEP, uh, in responding to the COVID crisis, realizing that many countries, especially smaller um, uh, hospitals, will not have the appropriate incineration and therefore will result to open burning. And so the understanding that that open burning is the fumes from which, the debris from which, the ashes from which will pollute the soil, pollute the air, etc. So there's a reality there that is happening right now, which is why we've reached out to uh, those of our member states that have this need to talk about uh, how one can deal, together with our friends at, at uh, WHO, who deals with the con contamination part, but we deal with the after effects after open burnings have taken place, etc. It is an, a significant point, but it therefore uh, talks to investing in, in solid municipal, uh, municipal solid waste management. If I may, um, I have said it before, I'm gonna record to say, whilst COVID-19 has been a horrible and is dreadful in its impact, it is but an overture to what climate change or the collapse of natural systems will be. So we better understand that um, this is not, a, I mean, obviously we need to deal with the health issues, don't get me wrong, but the bigger picture is one of, of, of too impossible to contemplate, which is why, you know, the existential dimension of the climate crisis, the existential dimension of the related nature crisis cannot be underestimated. Loss of natural forests, the loss of the forests that regulate the very weather that we have, which therefore regulates how our rainfalls come, which regulates therefore what harvest we can have, which regulates how much water we have in our rivers, all of that, which is the fundamentals of life. This is at stake, a two degree world. And right now we are on our way towards a nearly four degree world is something that is not possible to contemplate. So this is not on the nice to have list, this is on the absolutely essential list, which is why when we talk about trade and environment, integrating this becomes critical because failure to do so will deliver a future, not very far in the future, I'm afraid, uh, that will be unlivable in countries and in regions, uh, will change the weather, will change ocean oscillation, will change uh, harvests and therefore will essentially become uh, not very friendly to humankind and will drive conflicts, will drive poverty and will drive all of those other elements. So 
let COVID therefore be that wake up call. And I don't wanna be doom and gloom because we have the solutions, they're right before us. Minister Sreya speaks about renewable energy. Uh, Mr. Godfrey speaks about the solutions that private sector can bring. So trade and environment needs to therefore go very much hand in hand and bring those solutions forward. I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Executive uh, Director. Um, as you said, what is clear even more and more, there's a lot more at stake than just trade and the environment, but a lot rests on those two uh, limbs. Uh, so we certainly have to take that uh, on board. I'd now then invite uh, our DDG, WTO, uh, to take the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Blackman. The uh, one thing, of course, that has come up in these discussions today, the interventions, is to build in uh, uh, environmentally uh, sound products to begin with. So to the extent, for example, use of cotton, uh, growth of cotton, growing cotton, actually it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. So uh, to the extent cotton can be used, that is a, uh, um, a, a direct benefit. Uh, to the extent that more uh, efficient uh, goods are available, uh, more envi environmentally friendly goods are available, uh, trade is going to supply them across borders. Investment is very slow. Uh, stockpiles did not uh, suffice to meet the needs of the pandemic. Uh, in a more general sense, I would say that uh, uh, I was on a panel last week in which uh, one, one panelist said, uh, the WTO is uh, not, a, not a crisis management system. Um, I would differ with that assessment. Uh, yes, cycle time can be very long. On fishery subsidies, it's been a very long time that that has been under negotiation. Uh, it's a very serious and very difficult subject. We'll get there in the end. But I would say that the WTO, the multilateral trading system, was born uh, as a crisis management mechanism uh, to recover from the destruction of uh, two world wars and an economic depression. Uh, and uh, it's been used to uh, uh, recover from uh, unilateralism, from uh, uh, problems of uh, currency misalignments in the past uh, through negotiations. Uh, our cycle time has to get better, and uh, we're faced with not only a crisis but an opportunity now, and that opportunity is not only to uh, manage better with respect to pandemics, because this will not be the last one. But as um, uh, the uh, executive director said uh, from UNEP, uh, uh, this is sort of a training session for what we have to do with respect to uh, global warming, which is a far bigger problem. So we have two crises. One takes all the headlines right now, and that is uh, the COVID-19. And that's to be, ex that's understandable. It's uh, with the amount of deaths and uh, hospitalizations worldwide, uh, our focus has to be there. But we can't lose focus on the longer term because it's uh, also an existential challenge, even greater existential challenge. So uh, we're, we're in training now uh, and we've got to perform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy D Director General uh, Wolf, for, for your, your, your uh, intervention there. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'll invite uh, Dame MacArthur to give her response. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to briefly touch on the negative externalities of PPE. There's obviously, as Executive Director Anderson said, an issue in hospitals where there is no incineration. Um, in many countries in the world, PPE through hospitals does have a channel to go in. It's not circular for sure, it's incineration, but that it's designed to fit within a channel and is dealt with within the hospital. PPE out of sight, outside of hospitals is a very different issue. And I think, you know, we've come out of the shock of the pandemic or we was perhaps for some areas, we're still in the shock of the pandemic um, and we're dealing with things how we can. But when we look at the journey, for example, of plastic bags and what the minister has talked about in Rwanda, plastic bags were banned in Rwanda. That has transformed moving goods within Rwanda. 
um, PPE, which is non-recyclable or non-cloth or non-compostable, perhaps that outside of hospitals is something which could be banned if there isn't a system for it to go into, because within a circular economy, you design for a system. But I'd like to end on that, that point, which has been made so eloquently by Executive Director Anderson. This is so much more than COVID-19. We have had a shock from COVID. We're still living within that. But this is about the entire system absolutely having to change. It's about linear to circular. It's about building something that's restorative and regenerative. It's about as we reorientate, as we re rebuild uh, those industries, as we put those jobs in place, let's make sure those jobs get us in the right direction towards a regenerative and restorative economy. And climate is a massive issue. When you look at the shift to renewables, that tackles about half of the challenges around climate. The other half is within the goods and services that we use, the way they're produced, the way they're moved around. If we switch to a circular economy, we design out waste and pollution, we keep products and materials in use, and we regenerate those natural systems, we have a significant impact on that remaining 50% of carbon. Just taking five specific goods within the economy tackles half of that. This is a really big deal when it comes to climate change, but it also affects biodiversity in a positive way because you're regenerate, re regenerating natural systems. You're becoming much less extractive and consumptive. So you're not mining so much, you're not damaging things, you're not eating back into that forest even further. So I would urge very much, yes, absolutely, we have to deal with COVID-19, but let's keep focusing on the big picture and most importantly, work out what success looks like for our global economy and then make it happen. Thank you very much, Damon. I think that that's an excellent note uh, to, to, to end on. Let's see what success looks like and work backwards and, and build the infrastructure towards that destination. Uh, and it, it's really pretty much left for me to say, um, we've come to the end of a very robust, very rich and very timely uh, global high level discussion on issues relative to trade and the environment in the context of COVID-19. We've had a very distinguished panel uh, spanning uh, the sectors of, of government, institutions, uh, the business sector and NGOs, uh, giving very clear and well thought out crystallized uh, methodologies on how can we rebuild stronger? How can we rebuild better? How can we still promote growth in the global economy whilst balancing the need for sustainability and resilience, uh, ensuring that the environment is not compromised because COVID-19 has really showed us um, that we have to do all of these things in a very short period of time. And as I always say uh, to many of my colleagues and further afield, is that we should never waste a good crisis. And certainly now that we are at ground zero, as I would have said in my opening remarks, now is the time for us to redouble our effort. Now is the time for us to reimagine a global economy that is sustainable and that brings prosperity for all, but in a way that does not harm the environment and in a way that does not uh, inhibit the progress of, of trade and growth, which is the core uh, mandate really of, of this organization to ensure that prosperity for all of our people is at the forefront. And I re I'm really heartened um, by our participation today. We've had quite uh, a high number of participants online spanning from all across the globe. And I think that this has really set the tone for a very rich set of dialogue over the course of this week for Trade and Environment Week in the WTO. And I really want to thank sincerely all of our panelists for uh, joining us today from across the world and different time zones. Um, but really with one singular message, we have to work together to build a strong, resilient global economy that is sustainable uh, for all of us. So once again, I thank you. Thank you to our interpreters and wherever you are in the world, please join in this week for the rest of the events that we have planned for the Trade and Environment Week 2020 at the World Trade Organization. I thank you and good afternoon to all of you.